In my culture, women could aspire, but most women could not aspire to be all they wanted to be because sometimes there were invisible barriers. Sometimes there were there were those um, things that kept women down, not because they wanted to bend, and they have to bend to those barriers because that meant their existence. Hello and welcome to Inspiring Open, candid conversations with influential women whose careers and open ethos have pushed the boundaries of what it means to build community and succeed as a collective. I am Betty Kankambwedu, a journalist and women's rights advocate. Join me as I explore the fascinating backstories behind Africa's most tenacious female personalities. Inspiring Open is a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women, a project of Wiki in Africa. Be inspired, be challenged, be bold. Our guest today is Dr. Inkem Osugui. Her first experience of the magic of a library was at the tender age of five, when her mother left her with a local librarian to go to the markets during a civil war. The impressions she took away with her that day lasted a lifetime and led her into a career working in libraries and with librarians that spans over 35 years. Income strongly believes libraries are more than books and that the power they hold to impact, tell and preserve the history of communities remains untapped in Africa. This is the work that she and the team at AFLIA, the African Library and Information Associations and Institutions are dedicated to. Equitable access to information and knowledge for all. Income wants librarians to go beyond being disseminators of information to information leaders in their different countries, telling the stories of their communities on a global platform. She is the chair of the public library section of AFLIA. Now on Inspiring Open, Dr. Inkem Osugui. What does Inkem mean? I'm sure there's a meaning to your name. <laughs> Inkem means mine. Oh. But the full name is Nkem Delim, my own that belongs to me. And the story behind it then was that my father said that um, the land he, he, he bought, his uh, kindred wanted to take it from him. And it was around that time that I was born. So he now named me, my own belongs to me. Which part of Nigeria are you now? Whereabouts in Nigeria are you now? I'm in Southeast, mm. that's in Anambra State. Okay. Is that where you grew up? Yes. Oh, that's You know, there are more than um, 200 tribes in in Nigeria, and I am uh, Igbo. Tell me about your childhood. Um, How was growing up like? And can you describe the era you grew up in and how it particularly was for women? I was born in the mid-60s. And then my first memories actually were that of a civil war. My um, my part of the country wanted to opt out of the country and there was a war. So those were my first memories, you know, of uh, seeing my brother, or one of my brothers that came back from the war front, you know, um, standing with my father, taking pictures. I was on my father's shoulders. I remember that. When the, uh, what do they call them? Airplanes with guns will come, you know. Um, we had this underground um, bunkers where my mother will, will take us to. Then, but a striking memory that I remember was the war ended before I turned five. And uh, around that time, my mother had an, another baby because I'm five years older than my immediate um, junior. So when she had the baby, my my father used to not to be around so much. So it was just my mother and I and the two um, ones that were older than me. So she wanted to go to the market and she didn't want to leave the baby with me. She felt that uh, I will not look after the baby well enough. Uh, I'll be naughty enough to forget that I had a baby to look after. So she, she took me along, carried the baby on her back you know, tied with, you know, wrapper. And we started going to the market. It was a long way off. So along the way, she now said, if she takes me to the 
market, that extra work for her. That lets her check if the library was open. So she checked and it was open and she dropped me there. And it was in that place that I felt the first sense of who I am as a person, who I am, accept, I don't know how to put it, I had that sense of acceptance. Because that day we had we had this woman um, librarian telling kids their story. There were a lot of kids, you know. It was after the war; um, the clothes were not beautiful, you know, and uh, nobody had real shoes. Hmm. But the librarian took us in. She now told us one story about the competition between the um, the wind and the sun. They saw that the wind and the sun were um, in a competition to see who is stronger. They kept on arguing until they saw a man walking on the road, carrying a load um, and putting on a big coat. And they now agree that whoever makes the man take off the coat, his coat is the stronger person. So this librarian, not minding how we looked, not minding anything to that story. She'll go from one side of the room to the other. She'll blow like the wind. She'll shine like the sun. You know, that kind of thing. And all of us were like, well, hey, this is good. And eventually the, uh, the, the sun won the competition. But in telling that story, she like opened my own eyes to possibilities outside of the things that I've known, you know, that there are greater things that one can experience all within the pages of a book. And that's how I fell in love with it. Your first experience in the library, obviously, as you describe it, was fantastic and great. And Mm -hmm. as you say, you felt some level of acceptance there. Exactly. That's just the word acceptance, yeah. Did you go back there? Yeah. You know, when my mother now picked me up eventually, you know, I I now, later I remember that, you know, it was like a story. uh, So when my mother now picked me up, um, I told her everything, but she couldn't take me back as often as I, I, I wanted. But I can tell you, I, I did my primary school, finished my, secondary school, and I went back to that library, that same library. I applied and got a job as a library assistant. And I worked in that same library for Ah. 35 years. Yeah. Wow, for 35 years? Exactly, yeah. How did you feel like working in a library you first fell in love with? How was that experience like? It was uh, great to run the story as, you know, it was great to watch children grow up, you know, and at, um, at an extent, there was a time that people would drop their kids as young as uh, maybe one and a half years, you know, they could walk, not talk well, but when you read stories to them, everyone will go quiet like that. And they'll be watching your mouth, watching your hands, as if you are everything right there and then. You know, it's as if you're creating a new world for them. So I worked in the children's section for for one year plus. Then I went on to do my, my first degree, my second degree. I, I came back to the library, to the same library. <laughs> then um, seats were created and the old Anambra was carved um, into two and the Enugu, Enugu was now in a state and we moved down to Anambra and I, again, I continued with the library. I became the head of the library. I I was the head of the library for for six years. I, it was great watching the library grow. You know, there were eleven libraries in the system, more than a hundred plus um, staff. Because I started work actually at the age of fifteen years, and um, there's this uh, law in in Nigeria that you must serve government not more than thirty five years. So at at fifty years, I left. Wow. Being at the library was a place where you could create your own world. Exactly. How 
did this place where you could create your own world impact your life going forward in the future? You see, when you're growing up, even at, at any age, you can concentrate on the things you see. The things you see, you feel that is all there is. Or the things you feel you know, that's all there is. But the library taught me the possibility of different pathways of life. The library also made me more understanding of the different views of people. In, uh, in Africa, maybe you're born into a, a family and the family goes to a, a particular church. You know, that's all they know. And when you want to go out of it, it's like, no, this is how it's been done or caught. Or, oh, no, this is how it's been done. But, but the library taught me that, I mean, there are so many people all over the world and they believe in different things. That doesn't make them different from me. Scratch the skin, it's still the red blood on that. You know, whether it's the color of the skin, whatever. It, it made me realize that the, the world is not restricted to my particular knowledge or perception or whatever, that there are other people that believe different things, that do different things, and there are all people too. I had I gained more tolerance. Let me give you an, an, an example. There was one day somebody came to the library. Then it was after my second degree. And the person in Enugu, the person said that he's looking for a particular book on witchcraft. You know, being an African, being a Nigerian, hey, witchcraft, oh, this one is a witch. But I knew, I, I had learned that, you know, people will read, sometimes just for academic exercise, sometimes just to learn, some, even if it's to practice, how is it my business? So I, 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 I didn't even know that book was there on the shelf. Honestly, I didn't know. So I helped him search, found it, and he was so happy that he found what he was searching for. So working in the library made me more uh, understanding. I gained more understanding that there are different shades in the world. It's always not the best to think that your own shade is the best in the world because there are others there too. You don't know how they started to learn what they started to learn. You don't know why they are the way they are, but they are that way and you don't go condemning them because they are that way. Also, the library made me to see that, <laughs> you see, a woman can be anything. There's this name that we, that, that we, and uh, um, this thing in, uh, in my language, why in brief, that a woman is something, you know, it, it depends on the intonation. It can be one be fair, one be fair. It's the same spelling, you know, that a woman is light and a woman is something. Because I, I read books by women, story books as a child. And I was like, a woman wrote this, a girl wrote this, you know, and sometimes when the, the characters are, are girls, it's as if, let me enter inside that book and help to push this girl. You, you don't do this, go this way, you know? So it made me to realize that, see, a woman can be silent. A, a, a woman also has the right to exist, to be all she wants to be. You read books and it gave you this perspective that a woman can be anything she wants to be. A woman can be more than she is. Would you say that that was the prevailing circumstance there? Mm -mm. No, it wasn't. You see, culture, culture is strong, you know, and there are definite uh, pathways for women within different cultures. Now, in growing up, sure, women could aspire to be, but most women could not aspire to be. In my culture, women could aspire, but most women could not aspire to be all they wanted to be because sometimes there were invisible barriers. Sometimes there were, there were those um, things that kept women down, not because they wanted to bend, and they have to bend to those barriers because that meant their existence. Remember when we were chatting 
the other day I told you that I, I had plans, you know, once I do my PhD, then I do my, once I do my master's, then I do my PhD. Yeah. And after my master's, um, I, I, I went back to the library because then they say that um, then you, you couldn't do your PhD without two years practical work. And the other place I could have done my PhD then was up far in the north. My parents said, you're a girl, you're a young girl. How can we leave you to go there, to go and do your PhD? Who do you know there? Mm. So that closed the door then. And then also I got married. And my husband was like, sure, 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 you can do it. Sure, you can do it. He, 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 he didn't put any barrier. But the kids came. I have five children and uh, four of them are medical doctors. And the last one is in uh, his final year medicine too. Yeah. You know, you have to, is it when you're pregnant or is it when you're breastfeeding or is it when you're doing school runs up and down that you have to think of your PhD? No. So those are like invisible barriers. But it takes, um, it takes some focus. It takes some... Uh, some determination of some focus really to know that there's a place I want to get to. Let me tie my wrapper well. I, I'm, I'm going there, I will get there. So that was why it took me so long because I had the, the first kid, the second kid, and I had twins. So that it was like having four kids yeah. within four years. And yeah, uh, the first one was two years older than the, the second one. The second one was two years older than the twins. So like four kids in four years. You have to do a lot of things, help them do assignments, you know, stuff like that. So you could even think of, of yourself. And again, if you ask me to choose, uh -huh, I will always choose them. You know, mm -hmm. so that's why I said they're invisible, you know, barriers, you know. And uh, then I had the last one six years after the twins. Mm. So it's not as if women do not aspire, they do, but those barriers are there. And because we are all humans, along the way, you could get tired. Yeah. Or you, you, could, look, you could lose focus or you just wonder, I mean, what's the big deal about all this? I mean, why go on with this? You know, because by the year I finished my, my, my doctorate was the year I left government service, was the year I retired. And it was like, what are you going to do with it? Yeah. But it was what I determined for myself a long time ago. And I said, you see, you see that thing? I will get it. I will get there. But um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really better now because once I left the government service, I got a job, then I got another job, then that's this job I'm in now, and it's really, really more challenging than working in that library. This morning, I registered for a workshop on um, decentralizing the the web, you know, web 3.0. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I'm going in. I'm going to learn it yeah. by force, by fire. <laughs> I'm going to learn it because, <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, I'm going to learn it because uh, that's one thing I've gotten from the library. Mm. You have five children now. Yes. Four, four boys and one girl. Some are doctors and the last one is training to also be a doctor. Yep. The four are doctors, and I have a granddaughter too. Hmm. Oh, congratulations, <laughs> Grandma! <laughs> so, Thank you. with your children, how important was it for you to cultivate this reading culture in them? Um, you know, children learn from seeing what their parents do, and you know, in Africa, most often. That is the woman that stays with the kids more. Right from my first child, you know, um, I, I took all of them to, to the library and there were always books for them to read. And I made them realize that whatever you're reading, <laughs> always know there's a world out there outside of what you think you know. When they were in, in primary school, the headmistress called me one day. She was a reverend sister. She said, Madam, I want to ask you something. I said, Ma, go on. She said, Don't be angry. I said, No, Ma, go on. She said that any time that they organize quizzes in the school or they take 
children outside for quizzes, that my children will answer questions that they never taught them, that they have knowledge that is not taught in school. How, how do they do it? So I told her that they read. Does it ever bother you that none of your kids like took your career path? Um, Because there are some parents, you know, they would want their kids, at least one, to kind of take the path that they took. Did they ever bother you? No, it doesn't. Like I told you, my late father was a medical doctor. My junior sister is a medical doctor. My most senior brother is a medical doctor. And my husband is a professor of medicine, so... So, okay. I'm a different person. <laughs> what did your parents think about this difference? They had wanted me to, to read law because they said that I, I read plenty of books. I said, no, I don't want to read law. I want a place where I can expand. A library is the best place. <laughs> Yeah, so they were not disappointed. I mean, because uh, when some parents notice that this one is different or that this one stays her mind or that this, this one has this determination that is uncommon, they let go and let the child um, explore whatever the child wants to be. Mm. So they were not disappointed, no. That's great to know. Mm. How would you describe being a librarian in Nigeria, for instance, you hardly find people say, oh, I want my child to be a librarian. Or you, you hardly even find people who even love reading say, I want to be a librarian. How is it like in Nigeria? The library sector for long has been like a silent thing. Silent in the way that you just go to that library. If people come, you attend to them, they read books and so on. It's in recent times that people have started identifying themselves as librarians, you know, trying to make impact in the larger society. You know, because everybody needs information. Everybody needs that access to information. And that access to information can do or undo or create a gap that will be hard to get over in uh, in years down. You know, when children go to school and um, parents cannot afford all the textbooks, parents cannot afford storybooks or extra text, supplementary reading and stuff like that, and the library is not there for them, that gap begins to be created between the haves and have notes. You know, and that's what libraries have been trying to address, even in Nigeria, for people that listen, that if these textbooks are not available, are not affordable for you, get to the library. You see such books, or even if you don't see, the child will see books that will still teach the same thing. Then also, then with the um, digital age, People have access to internet, some people have access to computers, some people have access to, to skills, you know, to get things on the internet. But still, there are, there are so many in Nigeria, in entire Africa, that cannot afford the data for internet, do not have the skills to navigate the internet well, do not know where to source for opportunities online. And the library is always there to, to help them to do that. In some communities, the library may be the only place where you can get um, almost free or very cheap internet. And that's what is, is tough. It's tough to convince people, especially because that divide is already there. The people can, that can afford feel that, how can you say people can't afford this? But it's true, you know. And now the people that can't afford it, getting to them to come to the library, when the library is not as equipped as it, as it should be for them, is, is an uphill task. So that's one of the things that uh, Aflia is pushing us to let more and more um, privileged uh, people or people in the higher classes understand that libraries cannot be ignored. And then you think that the community or the town or the country or the continent can get on because everybody 
must be included in sustainable development. It's not for a few, it's for everyone. No one should be left behind. And in, in doing that, you have to think of spaces where the, the people that do not, that are not privileged, can also go and assess information, can go and learn new skills, can go and use computers free of charge, can go and uh, do whatever or learn or get access to learning. And, you know, because libraries are mainly funded by governments and governments are interested in, in institutions that generate revenue. Libraries do not do that. They're also interested in, uh, let's say, things like um, for the public good, you know, roads, health, and so on. Forgetting that when you forget to develop the minds of people that are not privileged, there will come a time when they will fall on your neck because they do not know the things you know. They don't, they don't know the nicer things of life. They are not educated. They don't have skills to do this or that. And they keep on descending lower and lower into the lower class. Uh, yeah, and if there's no way to get them out, everybody will suffer eventually. Yeah. It will be a long road, but I think it can still be done. Mm -hmm. Most important mm -hmm. thing is that it started. So for people who may wonder what is Aflia and what yeah. What do you do? AFLIA came about because, um, you know, there's IFLA, International Federation of Library Associations, that uh, is the global body for librarians, library associations and stuff like that all over the world. But along the way, African librarians notice that, you see, the things that apply in the um, Netherlands are not the same things that apply in Ghana. The understanding of uh, what library, what a library is, is different in different climes. And then uh, we've been also been able to, we, we are building the capacity of uh, African librarians and building them up into a network so that librarians in Botswana can have access to what's happening in Kenya, can have access to what their colleagues are doing in Cameroon. Afia has three official languages, English, French, and Portuguese, to ensure that we reach um, everyone. I can assure you that it's not been easy at all. It's not been easy because we, we are used to playing in our own, uh, on our own toes. And now we want to go across boundaries and uh, across borders and uh, work with others, but it's growing. And then we, we got a boost at the initial stage from um, Global Libraries. Global Libraries is an initiative of uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. They helped us with um, funding and we were able to run um, a leadership academy. We were able to, to train um, librarians in public and community libraries in call it uh, 20 countries or so. That's what AFLIA has been doing. And then creating that consciousness amongst librarians that you can change the world if you, if you can put your mind to it. You can change your community if you put your mind to it. You don't have to stay just behind your desk and feel, oh, I've done the work for the day. What happens when the library doors are closed? Are you mm -hmm. still a librarian then? You know, so those are the kind of things we've been doing, yeah. Mention free knowledge brings me to the open movement and your work with Wikipedia. We know Wikipedia is an open or free knowledge source on the internet. How are you merging these worlds to open up knowledge even more? Looking at Wikipedia, you know, that's marvelous global entity. And we don't have a voice there. African librarians are not there. No, no, it's not possible. So... That was really what made us to push into that, to ensure that the librarians in Africa understand what free knowledge is all about and the role they have to play in ensuring that that free knowledge that is out there is real, relevant, accurate, according to what they know, at least about their communities, the people there and, and the stuff that they do. So that was the main push. I mean, who tells your stories? Who's going to tell me who I am? I have to tell you who I am. It's not you. I, every other thing you can say are just conjectures, you know. So that was the way that we um, approached it. And uh, then the issue of uh, free knowledge. 
you know, the default setting of libraries is open, opening up knowledge for everyone, opening up um, knowledge for students there so that it's not just what is taught in classrooms. They can come to the library and explore more about what the lecturer said. So that open setting, it, it, we, we also found it in Wikipedia. There are treasures inside libraries, treasures I can assure you. When you go to national libraries that collect legal deposits, some books are there, collected, right, you know, right inside there, and nobody knows about them. Maybe the author or the publisher doesn't get to push them as much as uh, he or she can. So we are going to go into how do we make such collections visible through wiki source, you know, wiki books and uh, stuff like that. Yeah. So we we just started. We just started in opening up knowledge. Yes. And uh, identifying the Wikimedia Foundation is really a great, great thing for us to walk along with, to know that, yes, this is um, an organization, uh, you know, with platforms that can that can work with libraries to open up knowledge more and more. So you visited the Nashville Public Library, and I think among the many thoughts you had was African public libraries taking a deeper look at how they can preserve their history, mm. you know, through the library system. Can mm. you um, elaborate on that, and and why did that thought come to mind? Our visit to Nashville was because of the Leadership Academy of Afia, the one that's founded by uh, Dylan Melinda Gates Foundation. You know, because after some training, we were now supposed to go and see what they do in other climbs to add to what we already know, because um, leaders should, should stand out. Leaders should be those who dare, you know, to chart new ways, not just sit at your desk and say that you're a leader. So we went there. And when we got there, you know, first of all, we were introduced to all the big bosses, you know, we had their programming, their services. And then they said, let's visit the civil rights room. I was like, what? Civil rights room? And we went there, Browns. And when we got into the, the civil rights room, first of all, there were these uh, inscriptions on on the doors about history and so on and so forth. And then we um, we now sat down and they now started that this place we are sitting down is shaped like the like, like the counter of the bar or something like that. That is, is it is where so many things happened and that was how they started. And then and there were pictures. You know, they didn't have so many books there. They didn't have so many books, just just a few books, but there were so many pictures, uh, artifacts, mm. you know, modern ones, so to speak. And they now went from one to one to tell us about the civil rights movement. So it, it turned out that everything there was, was a story on its own about what happened. And the library was collecting it. The library, was, newspapers were there, newspaper cotton, some headlines were framed, you know. And there was one, I think it's by this man that's dead, Lewis, John Lewis, I think. Yeah, John Lewis, yeah. Yeah. If not now, when? If not you, who? Mm. And I was like, wow, this wasn't a great quote he made when, let's say, uh, let me now make the motivational quote. No, it was maybe born out of circumstances of the things that were happening and he needed to encourage people. And then this library collected all of them, all of them. And we we're all awestruck. Even the things that are happening now where I am is history tomorrow. Anything that happens today is history tomorrow. And that is the only way to build social justice. When people know that this is the, the path that we came along, these are the things that happened. Because, sorry to say this, politicians in Africa get away with plenty of things because history is not known. Mm. History is not showcased, you know, highlighted so that people will know we've been along this path before. This is the history of this man that wants to be this or that. Will he change overnight? I mean, where was this man when all these things were happening? Was he a part of this? 
we're all like, what is this now? Eh, what is this? You know, I've never thought of libraries in that way. We are good at collecting books, you know, access to information and so on. But that aspect of social justice, that aspect of allowing history to tell you, so, you know, to have his own voice so that whenever you want to know, where are we coming from? Mm. What caused this? What caused that? You know, what are the indicators of, let's say, social unrest? Stuff like that. They are all within the events of today. The good of the continent, the, the, the bad of the continent are all within the events of today. And when tomorrow people that come in do not understand the events of yesterday, they repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again, giving trust where trust should not be. You know, then they were planning an, explan um, an expansion. And that one blew me off entirely. That expansion was, they said, there are still voices in the room that need to be heard. Ah, yeah. And of course, it was all about women. You know, because even in collecting history, you collect history of big events by men. But the women are there doing maybe the small, the, the things you call small. But those are people too in the, in the struggle for a better life for the family, for the community, the nation, their offices, their, their, their co everything. And their voices need to be heard too. For every library, I, I mean, there should be a, really a corner where they tell history, they tell stories of history, especially that of women. Because women are like the silent scaffolding that holds the building up. You know, it's like, uh, you, woman, sit down there. You're not a part of history. Who said? Yeah. Libraries can address that. Libraries can address that and get the voices of the women who can speak and those that can speak. This is so interesting how the library can preserve their community's history for the new generation to also know where they are coming from and how to move forward. But we have a situation yes. where in most African countries, um, libraries, particularly the community ones, are going extinct. What do we do mm. about this? A library can be underfunded. Most of them are. But the librarian or the library staff, you get your salary and you sit down and say, there's not enough money for this, there's not enough money for that. There are so many little things you can do to change the lives of people in the community. Let me tell you about one library in Uganda that I went to, Nakaseke Library. We went there, and when I got there, they called their like board of trustees, and there was this fantastic-looking old woman. If you see her funky wig, the wig was as cute, you know, it didn't, it didn't balance well. And inside the library, she put on these funky eyeglasses that I'm sure she wasn't seeing through, you know, white-rimmed and so on. And she was there. She was well made up, but you see, it's an old, you know, village woman. And the woman, I was just, they were saying so many things, but it was that woman I was looking at. So after, I asked them, please, who is this? They said, her name is Madame Ruda. She can't speak English, but she's on the board of the library. So I asked them to, to translate for me. And I asked her, Ma, how are you? She said she's fine, that this place is their place, that this place helps uh, them. And I asked her, how does the library help you? She said, ah, that they don't hear what they're saying in uh, radio, that the library will interpret for them, especially about the market prices of their farm pro, uh, produce that the the library will tell them they will go there and ask them if i want to sell banana ugali i want they used to make ugali if i want to sell it which market will i go to that is best for it now 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 and that the library will search and tell them that this market they are selling um, a bunch for this and this one they are selling a bunch for this but again consider the transport cost for this for that to that area and that helps them know where to go then also he said that the library helps to tell them the weather today may not be good how does the librarian do it word of mouth you see, so they made that woman because she's the community woman leader. They made her a member of the management committee 
She doesn't read the, but because she's a member, a strong member of the community. You know, so these are the things that we are telling libraries to do, librarians to do. Don't depend on government all the time. The people you're serving, serve them in the areas that they need service. It doesn't all have to be big books all the time. It doesn't all have to be shiny computers all the time. Yeah, see, this is Africa. And we need to serve our people the way, the things that they want. Set your communities where they are. Don't look for high highfalutin ideas. And that's one of the ideas behind this, why we did this uh, Wikipedia course. Collect the history of your community. Find out who are the notable people there that have not been written about in this big global platform. Work with the people to know and push them inside there. The people that can teach them skills on how to talk about their communities on Wikipedia too. So that it's not just them coming to read or find books all the time. Let the library also be a place where they go to tell their history, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. So from what you are saying, I'm here thinking then libraries are more than books. And the example exactly. in Uganda makes it so clear the library can be this source of knowledge mm. in a community and it can build up a community in ways that we, we can't even imagine. Yeah. And, um, you know, the library is not also just for people that are that can read English or read French or Portuguese. That was one of the reasons why um, Afia has worked with African Storybook and um, Story Weaver. They have uh, these open source um, platforms where you can go and translate storybooks into your local language. So that even if somebody is 70 years, 80 years, some people still enjoy reading. People can read their own local languages. Then they can find books there. Then also we found out that um, many local languages are dying. In quotes, like um, when I was translating some storybooks on Story Weaver, <laughs> I couldn't find any word for Internet of Things in my language. I couldn't find any word for robots, you know, because we feel that learning should just be in this language we are speaking. Yeah. How about the languages that we are born in? You know, because it's been proven over and over again that children learn first in their mother tongue. Yeah. When they learn in their mother tongue, they keep it. They go to school, they learn English, they keep it. And then there won't be a meeting of knowledge learned in school to be applied locally. And that's why you see so many engineers in Africa. How many of us can produce computers? You know, because all those things are floating up there in the air. There is this obsession by parents to teach their children the English language over their local dialects. Here in Ghana, and I'm sure in Nigeria as well, there are so many children who are in their teens and they can't speak any of the local di dialects. And it just amazes me. It's almost become like a trend. They and feel that I'm like, they have arrived. They have yes. arrived. You know, they are part of this uh, elite. Yes. You know, that's, that's the, excuse me to say this, that's the colonial mentality. You know, because when you think that you're not enough in yourself, forgive me for going back down this path, but Please you go. know, when Africa was colonized, Africa was not in any dark age. There were things going on in different parts of Africa. It's possible that if we were allowed to go at our own pace, we would have been where we wanted to be. We, we, we got to learn English. We, we, we got to learn their culture. We got to read their history, um, Renaissance, Reformation, and all those uh, English things and so on. That does not mean that the one in Africa, it doesn't exist. It does. It does. Sometimes when you go through the proverbs of your people, you see the wisdom inside there. You can't throw away who you are because people said you are this or that. Who you are is who you are. Let people have their own definitions of you, but you have to learn to define yourself who you are 
as as a person, as a community, as a country, as a people. Let me not go into that, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting listening to you and I'm so happy I'm just here nodding and I'm just I'm so excited this is such an exciting conversation by the way so in camp for young librarians obviously the road is not easy um because I'm sure you didn't have it easy but what would you tell them to keep going and not give up well the first one that I want to say is own your profession, own it. Like on Twitter, my my Twitter handle is librarian and Kim. And if you don't like it, that's your business. That's me, you know. So own your profession. That's number one. Then number two, you see, there's something, the power of social media is great. I sometimes when I go to Twitter, I don't comment, I don't do anything, but I I, I read what others are writing and I learn. And from there, I'm de- slowly building my own network of um, librarians and other people. Like this morning I checked, I think I've, I have up to 5,500 followers and that, that, that doesn't say much too. So, you know, young librarians should also explore the power of social media. You learn if you want to learn, not to go and do crazy things that you learn. And then also, flow you know learn and see what others are doing explore opportunities but first of all you have to own the profession own it don't uh, don't feel sorry for yourself oh i'm a librarian there's no money there's no there's, no own it when you own it then you can now you you'll be surprised that people will now flock to you to ask you what is that you're doing then explore the power of social media as a librarian, you'll be amazed at the opportunities that you see. When, when, when I first came in contact with Afia, it was in Accra. I went for a conference. We were quite a lot of people that went there. But I believed in, what's, in, in, in what I saw, in what I heard. And through the social media, I did a lot of things, you know, promoting Afia, you know, talking about things and so on. And when this job, when the opportunity came up, I was called for an interview. I went through it and I got the job. You know, because you you you, you can't hide your light under under the bushel and expect the world to see it. You have to shine so that others will see. And, and social media is really, really a good place to do such things, you know, with focus again, focus, focus. Then, of course, I'll say, belong to Aflia. Find out what's happening. I can go on and on and on, but again, because I'm speaking from my own position of here, the, I, 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 I may not be feeling the pinch that, if, that you know, of these young people. So that's why I want to, because there are things you can, you tell them to do and they say, oh, we can't even do it, but social media, all of them are there. Go to Facebook, they are there making noise so they can use it to improve themselves. <laughs> For somebody who's lived the life, you know, through the years and you've seen life from all angles growing up, you at a young age, you even saw war and the effects of war, um, being a librarian, reading books, dreaming and dreaming big. And where you are today to the point that we consider your journey so inspiring that you are on this podcast. What would you tell the young people who are being sold an illusion on social media? First of all, there's no quick fix. Yeah, opportunities can come up, you know. um, Sometimes, um, let's say, God can surprise you, but there are no quick fixes. You know, everything in life is a process. The thing that is seen openly and applauded by so many was first worked on in the dark room. And... um, Patience works. The what one aspires is, you know, whatever your goal is, whatever your dream is, please can you break it down into, into milestones so that if by 20 you have a first degree, that's a big milestone. If by 20, whatever you have another one, that's a big milestone. You know, so that you don't think that everything can come in one day. Break it down so that um, you live to enjoy it. Then also know that social media, not everything there is true. Some are just um, 
what they call catfishing, you know, just like a bait to draw people out. You know, not everything there is real. Some are from imagination, you know, because um, imaginations are everywhere. And my final question is, what do you know now that you wished you had known early on? Um, I wish that I had known that um, that life is never fair. It's um, a wild, harsh world out there. You know, that all is not love and goodness because you meet some people People, you come across people that will want to undermine you, want to sit on your head, you know, want to do wrong things. So don't think that everybody is fair and all about love. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much, Inkem. It was Thank such a you. pleasure having this conversation and it was so eye-opening to me personally. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Bye. Thank you, Inkem. Continue to do the great work to ensure African libraries and librarians are fully actualized. Dr. Inkem Osugwe is the chair of the Public Library Section of the African Library and Information Associations and Institutions. Thank you for listening to Inspiring Open, a podcast series from Wikilabs Women. This first series of Inspiring Open was funded through the International Relief Fund Organizations in Culture and Education 2021, an initiative of the German Federal Foreign Office, the Gothi Institute and other partners, and an annual grant from the Wikimedia Foundation. If you enjoyed today's show, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Feel free to share, rate, and review us. We appreciate the support. You can also tag us in your posts. We are at Wikilabs Women on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll leave you with the words of Ntozake Shange. Sisterhood is important because we are all we have to stand on. We have to stand near and by each other, pray for one another, and share the joys and the difficulties that women face in the world today. If we don't talk about it amongst ourselves, then we are made silent by the patriarchy and that serves us no purpose. Until next time, look after yourselves and your sisters. And remember, be inspired, be challenged, be bold. I am Betty Kankambwedu, and you've been listening to Wiki Loves Women, Inspiring Open. Inspiring Open.